Hare Krishna. Thank you for coming today evening. And today I'll speak on the Damodar Ashtakam. Does anyone, everyone know about the Damodar Ashtakam? Damodar Ashtakam. So this is one of the most beautiful prayers that is offered to Lord Krishna. And I won't speak on the whole Ashtakam. I'll primarily speak of the first words. But we will look at some important aspects of the nature of Krishna and love for Krishna that are revealed in the Damodar Ashtakam. So, now across the world, people have had some conception of God. They may not even call that higher being as God, but basically when we live in the world, sooner or later we realize that actually the things that I desire, even the things that I need, getting them is not entirely in my control. And therefore, we start thinking, what is it that determines those things? And then, is there some being beyond us who controls those things? So generally, Shri Prabhupada writes that all knowledge comes from God, but all knowledge doesn't begin with God. It's not that suddenly one day people start thinking about God. Our knowledge begins from the things around us. And then we may look, some people look at the big beautiful sky. And they start thinking, where did all this come from? How was this so beautiful? So our knowledge goes from the world to thoughts of, does the world have a source? Does the world have a controller? Is there someone overseeing all this? The Dhamma is big. So when we understand, maybe there is something up there which is in charge, then the mood becomes of reverence, of respect. That being, that ultimate reality, what it is, whatever it is, it can either, if things can change in the world in such a way that in one moment, our fortunes can change. We might just get one lucky break and our life can become excellent in one moment things can go terribly wrong <clears throat> so then the idea is that there are forces far bigger than me which which affect my life which shape my my future and maybe then i should have a respectful attitude to it for that now what is that reality so if you consider this verse uh, we'll recite the first line Namami Shwaram Satchidananda Rupa. So Namami Shwaram Namami. I offer my obeisances. I offer my respects. That is the first, first beginning in the biblical tradition. Is that fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. And the person to be most feared is the person who has no fear of God. If somebody has fear of God, then at least they will have some morals. Now this I should not do because I am unaccountable. It has some consequences. A person who has no fear of God, that means they think, hey, if I am just smart enough or strong enough to get away with whatever I do, then I'll do it. And that person is very dangerous. So, Namami. That idea that there is, I need to offer obeisances. I need to be respectful. Toward what? Ishwaram. So the, actually the Bhakti tradition offers us a very intimate vision of God. A vision that actually takes us very, very close and reveals God in uh, great clarity and intimacy. It's like if you are seeing now, distance can be physical, distance can be emotional. 
just like if you are seeing a mountain from a far distance, or like we see just a hazy outline. But then if you are flying a plane or a helicopter and the helicopter goes closer and closer and closer, then what happens? See, oh, there is so much greenery over here. There's this birds flying over there. There is this flowers over here. There is this waterfall over here. As we come closer and closer, we see more and more details. Now, this says there can be physical distance and then physical proximity, which changes vision. Similarly, there can be emotional distance or relational distance. If somebody might be a fan of some sports player or some movie star or even some politician. And then they know that person from a distance. And but if you come, if you come closer, maybe you work with them, talk with them, see them in real life, then we get to know them better. Sometimes that it's okay, I don't need it now. If we get to know them better, then what happens? Sometimes we find out oh, such a wonderful I thought it's a wonderful person, and then you get to know that person, you find they're not all that wonderful. So it's sometimes a disappointment, sometimes an anticlimax. Those who think we are great heroes, from a distance we think they are great heroes, we find that they have feet of clay. But they are not all that great. But sometimes if somebody is a really a wonderful person and the closer we get to them, the more the, more the admiration, the attraction, the affection increases. So in this first line itself, it's like in one line, we are zooming in, you could say, light years. There are millions of people who have some vague understanding. Maybe there is something up there. And I offer obeisance to it. In the Mahabharata, there is a description that actually when the war was going on between in Kurukshetra and Duryodhan was very confident. And I have a much bigger army. Does anyone remember, know the figures? What was the strength of the army of Duryodhana of, of the Pandavas? Does anyone remember? Know it? remember? Yes? I think it was um, Duryodhana's army had seven um, and then um, the Pandavas army only had six. Oh, excellent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, 7 plus 11 is how much? What is the significance of 18? 18 Puranas. The war lasted for 18 days. Bhagavad has 18 chapters. So, 18 is a very significant number. So, 7 plus 11. So, he thought that my army is so much bigger, I am very easily going to win. And then on the seventh day, he was severely battered. He, he, many, many of his warriors were killed. And then he tried, he had a plan to trap Bhima. He sent a whole elephant division to attack Bhima. And then <coughs> Bhima was gone. Bhima, this elephant division was just routing Bhima's Pandava army. Bhima, Bhima came there. And Bhima would also fight with bows and arrows. But when he would get angry, his bow and arrow don't work. Just put the bow and arrow down and just charge into the enemy camp with his mace. And he was so angry that when he would hit with the mace, the elephants would fly away. Literally. And then the whole elephant division was getting routed. And Duryodhan got furious and he came to attack. And now Bhima couldn't fight both of them. So Bhima attacked him and thwarted him initially. And he came back again. But Bhima was fighting with all these elephants. So Bhima's son Matodkaj came over. And Ghatotkach and Duryodhana were fighting. And Ghatotkach defeated and wounded Duryodhana. And that was especially humiliating for him. He thought, I can, I can beat up the father, but his son beat me up. <laughs> so that night, he, that night, he had sobered down a little bit. And he asked Bhishma, how is it that my army is so much bigger in number. My army has generals like you and Drona, and yet we are being defeated. What's happening? So then, Bhishma said that, Oh Duryodhan, I have been crying myself hoarse, trying to tell you that 
ahead. On whichever side there is Keshava. In the Mahabharata, Krishna is referred more by the name Keshava than Krishna. Whichever there is Keshava, he is supreme. Wherever there is Keshava, there will be victory. And now he has heard it many times, but he has never taken it seriously. So then, this time he says, really, because he has really been beaten up. <coughs> so then he asks, tell me more about Krishna. And then, in Duryodhana's assembly, Bhishma does Krishna Kapha. He tells Krishna's past, how Krishna lifted over the hill, how Krishna killed so many demons who came in so many dangerous forms. And Bhishma, and Bhishma is ecstatic. And Duryodhana is very sober. And that night he goes to his tent. And then he's about to sleep. He thinks, is Krishna really God? Is, if Krishna is God, then there is no harm in offering obeisance to him. So he turns in the direction of Krishna's tent and goes down. And then goes to sleep. And that's how even Bhishma's world has an impact. So Namami, Namami Ishwara. Even Duryodhan does that. But the problem is that for some people, spiritual knowledge is like light. And for some people, spiritual knowledge is like lightning. <laughs> what is the difference between light and lightning? <laughs> yeah, lightning is, is illuminance, but only for a short while. So Duryodhan had strong attachments. He said, I have to get this kingdom. So the next time when he woke up, next morning when he woke up, he's walked back to the default mood. He defaulted back to his dark mood. The change did not last. But sometimes when we see some display of power far greater than ours, that can make us feel, oh, there may be something godly over here. And let me offer my respect to it. So, Namami Ishwaram. It's often, for some people, the idea of God is associated with greatness. A power far bigger than our power. And when we see that, oh, let me offer respects. And it's good. Something unknown, but there is not just some vague power, but some, maybe there's personal control. So, from obeisances to the idea of a control. And that is Ishwaram. And it goes further. What is that person? The controller is Satchit Now The idea of God is sometimes very difficult for people to understand, especially if we talk about God as having power. Because if we think God is all-powerful, then we think that if, generally God is thought to have three main attributes. The, this they are omnipresent, omniscient, and Omnipotent, yeah. So he's present everywhere, he knows everything, and he can do everything. Now, if God is omnipresent, then how can he have a form? If I have a form, you have a form. If you are here in this room, then you cannot be at your home. Because our, our, we are limited by our form to a particular location. And we often have this conception. So here the word rupa is used, is rupam, there's a form. But what kind of form? Satchidananda rupam. Satchidananda means that this is an eternal form. Sat is eternal. Chit is it's made of consciousness. It's and ananda is blissful. So actually, this means that this form is non-material. Sometimes what happens in science is when there's a concept of causation and correlation. All of you know about the idea of vocabulary. Vocabulary is how many words we know. So did you know one interesting thing? That people who have bigger hands, science has found that they have bigger vocabularies. <laughs> Now, we say, what does that got to do with it? Isn't it? Bigger hands and bigger vocabularies? 
uh, no, I say this, this is strange, but all that it means is people who have smaller hands are small in age. They are not learned in upwards. words. <laughs> 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 People who have bigger hands, they are older. <laughs> and naturally they are not enough words. So the the correlation is true. Smaller hands, smaller vocabulary. Bigger hands, bigger vocabulary. But there is there is correlation, but it's not causation. The big hands are not the cause of big vocabulary. Both of them are the cause of are caused by something else. When the person grows up, their vocabulary grows and their hands also grow. <laughs> so causation and correlation are two different things. And if we don't understand this difference, then what happens? Just because we see two things together, we think, okay, these two are these two are interrelated as if a cause-effect chain. So the same principle applies to form and limitation. The, the, most people they have this problem with. How can God have a form, a little limit? But here there is a, the presumption is that when they talk about form causing limitation, let's, let's take it the other way. Suppose form is removed. Suppose say, suppose we are staying in this house now. Now we are living in this house. Suppose this house crumbles. Then we will have a formless heap over here. Now, would that formless heap be limited or unlimited? <laughs> limited, isn't it? So, even if the form is removed, the limitation remains. So, it is not that the form is the cause of limitation. Form, in one sense, oh, gives a visible shape and we can say it's limited. But, even if the form is removed, then still the limitation remains. So, the limitation is caused not by form. It is caused by matter. Matter, whether it is with form or without form, is limited. And spirit is, whether it is with form or without form, spirit has the potential to be unlimited. So what we are doing is, and there is a, um, we see a correlation. Form means limitation. But, and if so, therefore, if some, there is something unlimited, there should be no form. But in this case, the limitation, it's a correlation, it's not a causation. The form is not the cause of limitation. The form and limitation, which we see, that is because it's matter. When something is not made of matter, then it's not limited. Let me say, how do I understand this? It's like, let's consider something which is not exactly non-material, but something which is subtler. If we look at our own thoughts, our thoughts can go so fast. You know, you might, be, you might be thinking right now in this room, we were looking at hearing something some subject over here. And then the next moment you might be thinking about uh, maybe our home, next moment you might be thinking about maybe, okay, India is going to go to the moon. Or maybe I want to be a space scientist, I want to go to the moon. Or we can think of anything and everything. So our thoughts go very fast. Let me say, actually, it's just the thoughts you're going, it's not going, I'm just thinking about it. But then sometimes when somebody is absent-minded, their, their body is there, but they are not there, essentially. Their thoughts are somewhere else. So our thoughts are not, in a sense, limited by the laws of physics as we know them. Thought energy can flow anywhere. So if it's subtler than thoughts, is the consciousness which has thoughts, which thinks. So at the level of consciousness, there's no limitation. So what is the point being made? This Lord is Ishwara, but he is Satchidananda. He has a form, but that form is not ordinary. That form is divine. That form is transcendental. Satchidananda. And what happens because he's Satchidananda? He can, so God has a form, but God is not limited to his form. He's at one place, but if he wants, he can be at many places. He can expand himself. Can you think of any pastimes in which Krishna expands himself? Yes, yes. yes. then ask Leela, when he dances, 
on the past time yes brahma steals the cows you see expand as many cows as many as many cows and as many cowherd boys so krishna expands himself so although he has a form he is not limited to his form and not only is he not limited to his form it means he can have many many forms but also his form is not limited to one place it means if we see although krishna in the battlefield of kurukshetra is one person situated in one place he is situated on a chariot which is in one battlefield which is in one country which is on one planet which is within one universe but although krishna is within the universe the universe is within him that's what he chose in the universal form so that means krishna is not limited to his form and his form does not limit him in any way at all so even within a limited form he can manifest an unlimited universe and this past time will also reveal this because if you see this whole past time is centered around the form of krishna of course the center is the love between krishna and yashoda but that love is manifested around the the form of krishna or so yashoda tries to tries to tie krishna and she is unable to tie for a long time so prabhupad says that whenever a love is there the love has to be specific it's like any emotion the emotions become tangible when they become specific now so next one thanksgiving will come so what has happened social psychologists have found that positive emotions like gratitude are very helpful they conduce you to health they conduce you to well being this you should be grateful but there are there are many people who are strongly anti anti theistic <laughs> there are atheists and there are anti theists atheists are those who don't believe in god anti theists are those who are opposed to god they are militantly opposed to god so many people they don't accept god but they <laughs> but they still want to cultivate great gratitude they say okay life is so good i am grateful Who are you grateful to? So no, I am just grateful in general. <laughs> and to say that I am grateful in general is like saying I am married in general. <laughs> no, marriage is in particular. <laughs> no, married in general. Who are you married to? No, I am married in general. <laughs> It has no meaning. <laughs> so uh, emotions are like that. when the when the particular object to the emotion when the emotions are activated they become real they become more tangible so if god were just a formless ex- infinity so somebody might say okay god is like the sky is a formless infinity okay now how do you love the sky you just look at the sky and you may like the sky and look at the sky and make us feel peaceful but we can't have a personal connection with the sky so the whole idea it's it, the, the situation of love between krishna and ishoda is there but it's all centered around the form of krishna so namami shivaram satchit anand rupam the whole there is love but the, the magic of that love is centered on the magical form of krishna and then what is what is so special about that form that, is, that comes in the next verse what is the next verse lasat kundalam gokule rajmanam lasat kundalam so normally when we look at a person generally we look at the whole person but usually we look at the face of person that is where the face is the index in the index of the mind the index of the person how when we say that somebody how they looks are it's kind of the face they attractive they may be angry they may be scared they may be upset whatever the primary when you interact with the person you look at their face so now when the focus goes on this face as i said if the camera is zooming closer and closer and closer so from the vast infinity that there is a un- in there some unknown controller the camera is zooming closer and closer and not just to 
the divinity that has a specific form to the divinity that is doing a specific activity. Lasat kundalam. So kundala is what? Here, yes. So lasat is graceful, beautiful. Lasat kundalam. So he, he his his earrings are beautiful, and Gokule Prajamanam. Gokule in the land of Gokula, Prajaman is luminous, is shining. This conception of divinity, as is revealed in the Bhakti tradition, is is very enduring. I mean, sometimes <laughs> Prabhupada was Prabhupada would say that ultimately we are all talking about love of God. And you talk about different religious traditions. And Prabhupada said, Jesus said, I am the son of God. But Jesus did not give much specific knowledge about who is God. So Prabhupada says, Krishna says, I am Pita Ahamasa Jagatu. I am the father of all the beings. So then, many Christians will sometimes say that actually, if the God that Jesus referred to is Krishna, then why didn't Jesus say that? But Prabhupada gave many different answers. One time Prabhupada said, you know, Whatever Jesus told, for that you killed him. So how could you tell more? <laughs> <laughs> so that's one answer. But another point he says is that we have generic attributes of God and we have specific description of God. So if we consider the bhakti tradition, what it says is there are six opulences of Krishna. What are the six opulences? Beauty, wealth, knowledge, fame, renunciation, and strength. Yeah. So now, these six attributes, if anybody is beautiful, now will any traditions say that our God is ugly? <laughs> Nobody will say that. Is it? <laughs> will no, any tradition say that our God is a weakling? <laughs> Obviously not. <laughs> so beauty, strength, fame, Knowledge, all these are universal attributes of God. So now, what um, the reasoning which we can use over here is simple. Say, <clears throat> if somebody just walks into this house and he says, "I am the president of America," really, now we have reason to be skeptical. But if somebody comes in and they have the power to control the American army, the American navy. The American Air Force, right? their command, they get dispatched, they get sought. So now, it's anybody can make a claim that I am the, I'm the president of America. But the president of America has certain powers, certain attributes. So if somebody has those attributes, you could say it's reasonable to say that this is the president of America. So similarly, Prabhupada says, these are the attributes, similarly, we can say based on this definition, these are the attributes of God. Will any tradition say that these are the attributes? No. Everybody will agree. Some people say, is God renounced? That might be a question. The people may not be attracted to renunciation, but people are attracted to the fruit of renunciation. And what is the fruit of renunciation? Tyaga shanti ranantaram. When there is renunciation, then there is peace. In general, even people who are not spiritual, they appreciate somebody who is very peaceful, very calm, very composed. When life shakes us up and there are disturbances and somebody says stoic, somebody says phlegmatic, how do you stay so cool? So that coolness is actually a result of renunciation. That's what is appreciated by everyone. So these are the attributes of God. These six are the attributes of God. And Prabhupada says, here is a person who fits the will. Here is a person who exhibits those opulences. So if you have another person who fits those opulences, let's see. But there is no such description of the specific personality of God in other traditions. So it's not sectarian, it's universal. So what is happening over here is Vasat Kundalam Gokule Prajaman. This vision of God is that now normally people think of God as some being who's high up in the sky and maybe he short throws thunder with a judge and he casts thunderbolts on the sinful and sends them to hell forever. Now that is one conception of God. 
But the idea is, if God was simply a judge, now one of my friends is a judge in a court, and he told me that he likes his job, but it's, it's exhausting. It's a job. You're constantly judging for the people. Why is this person speaking the truth? What is the right thing? What is the wrong thing? He told me that if some, if I had to be a judge for eternity, I would soon resign from that job. So if now, if God for the rest of eternity has nothing to do except be a judge, then the job of God would be a very boring job. So what the what the Bhakti tradition says is, yes, being a judge is one aspect of God's job description. Just as people, they may have a professional role, but they also have personal life, how they are at home. So Bhakti, the Bhakti tradition reveals how God is at home. Vrindavan Gokula is God's home. And how he is at home is revealed over here. And this kind of revelation is not there in any other tradition. And how God is in his own. And what is described over here? Gokule Brajamanam. He is luminous. He's, he is, he is, uh, is a beautiful child. Now, people may not know about Gokul, but they want to go cool. <laughs> <laughs> but the real way to go <laughs> the, the real way to go cool is to go to Gokul. <laughs> so when we connect with the Lord of Gokul, when we develop love for Gokul for Gokul and then Krishna, then that is when we actually go cool. So we don't get so agitated by the world's ups and downs. Now, in Gokul, the word Gokul, what does it mean? Go is what? Cow. So Gokul is the abode of cows. And Krishna is a god who delights in simplicity. Now, in his abode, he plays a simple instrument, a flute. He bears a peacock. He, he is, is, if you say people love to have pets. Krishna's pet is who? The cows and the cows. Now, he is Gokule Brajaman. So Krishna is just a small child. And what is he doing? So he has this, this he, he has this earring and Lasat Kundala. This earring is shining. So actually, as I said, the vision is going closer and closer and closer. Uh, it's describing a particular activity. So now, why is this earring shining? It is, if somebody is running, then what happens? They're running, the ear, if they have earring, earring, the earring moves up and down. So, like that, Krishna's earring is moving. Why is it, why is it moving like that? Because he's running. And now, why is he running? That is described in the third line. <laughs> So now, what is the second line? Lasat Kundalam Gokule Rajamanam. That in this land of Gokul is shining, it's effulgent, it's attractive. This is the vision of God who is wearing an earring and he's running. He is, why is he running? Yashoda Vyolukha Ladhavamanam. Out of fear of Mother Yashoda, he's running. When the European colonial, colonial, colonials came to India, and especially when they came to North India, to the Mathura area, and there were these beautiful wall murals and paintings of Krishna eating butter. So then they would see so many pictures and they asked, is, who is this? So this is a small attractive boy crawling on the ground. So that is God. What is he doing? See, he's stealing butter. See, they just got intellectually short circuited. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, 
uh, how can God be a small boy? And even if God is a small boy, why is he stealing? And even if he has to steal, why something worthless like butter? <laughs> there are so many things to steal. So they, none of those ideas could make sense. So the point here is that Krishna in his home, he doesn't delight in his God. In, home, in his home, he simply delights in the reciprocation of love. And for that reciprocation of love, he takes the role that is most appropriate. So there are devotees who want to love him as a child. They want to be the parent of God. And Krishna accommodates that. Yad yad diyat urugaya vibhavayanti tat tadva pranyase sal anugrahaya. In the Bhagavatam, it is said that Brahmaji is praying that, my dear Lord, whichever form your devotee desires to worship you in, you manifest in that form for that devotee. That is your mercy on the devotee. So if some devotee desires to have the Lord as their child, now, philosophically speaking, it's impossible. Because God is the source of everyone. He is the parent of everyone. Nobody can be the parent of God. But in terms of philosophy, it's not possible. But in terms of uh, past times, Krishna can manifest that. So he manifests as a small child. And that is, again, the same principle. Although he is manifesting as a small child, he is not just a small child. He can do things which even a big child can't do. Or what is a big child, even a big man can't do. He has that power. So he's manifesting a small child and he is stealing. Now, why does he have to steal? Now, Krishna doesn't have to steal anything. Everything belongs to him. But the whole idea in Krishna Leela is that there is, there is excitement. And excitement is created whenever there is some kind of opposition to do something. Say, so if you are playing a game. Now, if the game is very easy to play and win. Like say, if in the, it's a cricket match between, say, India, maybe India is the world number one. And maybe some, if you consider cricket or something like that, then maybe some country like Holland, which is not even in the top 15 or top 20. So if it's a match like that, then it's always predictable who's going to win. There's always excitement in the match. Usually, excitement comes when there is some opposition. And oh, there is opposition that creates some suspense. Or oh, will this opposition be overcome? How will it be overcome? And there was this uh, in this uh, uh, Western fiction characters who came, was invented first, you know, Spider Man or Superman? <laughs> well, Superman. Okay, anyway, what happened was maybe it was Superman that they had this idea that Superman. As the, the character started evolving, they started making him more and more powerful. So Superman eventually, you know, he could just, even if a whole planet came to attack, he could just breathe and destroy the planet. So then what happened? As they made Superman more and more powerful, the popularity of Superman started going down. <laughs> then they had to create Superman as having some weaknesses, as having some vulnerabilities. You know, maybe a particular kind of rays he's not able to, he's not able to, he can't be protected against that. And the enemies would attack by those rays. So in general, if somebody is so powerful, that nothing can match them. Then there is no suspense, there is no excitement. So in the case of Krishna, although he's all powerful, he doesn't act as if he's all powerful. And to create excitement, now, Mother Yashoda can give him butter. If he wants to eat, she will happily give him. But just to have that excitement, Krishna does something which is not to be done. And that is stealing. So in stealing, oh, will, you will, get, will you get caught or will you not get caught? You will run away. If you run away, will, how will other people, if they catch, how will you escape from it? All that excitement is created. So the whole point of Krishna is to create excitement. So Krishna steals not because he's a thief. Krishna steals because that is an exciting activity. And, it's, and that's why when he's stealing, what is he stealing? And he's just butter. 
at one at one level because a butter is a butter is not a very valuable product it's not like not like gold or something like that but in the case of the when what happens is butter represents the love of the devotee's heart just like milk when churned carefully becomes butter so similarly a devotee's heart when is churned by the practice of bhakti it becomes like butter and krishna comes and steals the butter so krishna is known by one name which points to his stealing what is that name sorry navanit chor uh, navanit taskar anything else makan chor okay but any name which is about stealing but not necessarily about butter hari yes nobody is in a hurry to get this name huh? <laughs> so hari one who does hari one who steals so krishna steals our heart when it becomes soft like butter so what is krishna doing krishna when he steals he is actually just doing something which is exciting and endearing for his devotees so yashoda biyonuk lantavamana and this whole verse is actually describing the amazing nature of this conception of god i i started by saying how fear of god is the beginning of this and those who are those who don't fear god they are really fearful that they, we should be afraid of them because then they have no moral they have no scruples they nothing to check them so normally of course we don't want to stay at the level of fear of god we want to develop love of god also. but fear of god is a foundation but what is happening here instead of talking about fear of god we have fear in god god is afraid yashoda biyonuk lada or the complete hierarchy is inverted over it the soul is normally afraid of god but here god is afraid of the soul how can that be and that is the wonder of lila that now if we this is when we want to have a relationship with someone a real relationship means that there is an entire gamut of emotions if if you just we tell that somebody do something and they do it okay you might have a relationship with master and sir only but it's not a particularly rich relationship in a rich relationship pain is emotion are there sometimes anger is there sometimes excitement is there sometimes appreciation is there sometimes admiration is there sometimes exasperation is there so a rich relationship is ornamented by various emotions just like in a meal now we have different flavors and all the different flavors make the meal tasty so krishna also in his relationships wants to have the rich gamut of emotions and in a sense all the normally we don't want fear but it is not that we never want fear if 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 fear was always an unwanted emotion then horror movies wouldn't be so popular <laughs> when people go and watch horror movies what are they doing they want to be scared or you know horror movies there are these what uh, we call this this ride is in the roller coasters and it suddenly it goes down and people are scream and then they scared but after that they enjoy it i want to do it again <laughs> so what is happening that in our life we want to experience various kinds of emotions so fear as a sense of uh, if it's indicative of mortal danger then cause death that's that's of course something you don't want but fear also because it hikes up the nervous system it makes us more alert it makes us more receptive more so fear is also something which is experience in relationship and if god is truly complete then god shouldn't be deprived of any of the emotions that we humans have experienced when in fear also we experience you show the bio look la dhavam is in such fear that he is running he is running away from whom from his mother 
So his mother is upset with him, angry with him, and he's running. So now normally the soul is seeking God, but God is far away. But here God is running and the mother is seeking him. And not only that, what happens? Eventually, last line is what? Param Rishtam Atyan Ato Drupte So this Gopi, she's not even an extraordinary like an ascetic woman with mystic powers. She's simply a common woman, a Gopi. And what happens? Param Rishtam. She has run, she has run faster than Krishna. And she has caught Krishna. Atyanta to drutya gopya. Drutya means something is very difficult to go. Shri Prabhupada gave one of his disciples the name Drutta Karma. Drutta Karma means one who can do very difficult work. So this work of catching Krishna is extremely difficult. So she has run faster than Krishna and she has caught Krishna. And that is something which is incredible. So it's like there is there are the ideas of the inversion of hierarchy. Say so there is a if there's like a time, maybe there's a seven foot thief, and there is maybe a, a, a police who is like a four feet dwarf. And the four feet dwarf goes and catches the seven foot thief. How does that happen? So you change the hierarchy much, much more. The soul is tiny and Krishna is unlimited. But this tiny soul, one soul, Ishwara Mai, has got Krishna. And that is the power of love. That we will describe in the next verse. But this is an endearing vision. It's like sometimes uh, a movie. When a movie is to be promoted, it's not yet released. So they give a trailer. And generally, whenever in any story, what catches attention is unexpected terms, unexpected twist and turns. So it's like usually uh, when somebody is uh, writing a, say if somebody is writing a novel, or somebody, we have a TV series which is episodes. And when one episode is completing, then if people, they want people to come and watch the next episode, then usually they have like a cliffhanger ending. Cliffhanger literally means what? Maybe the hero and villain are fighting and the villain beats the hero and the hero is just falling off a cliff and he's holding on. And the, she, the villain is going to pound his feet on the hands, feet on the hands of Krishna. The hero and get into a fall and to be continued next <laughs> So, when it comes like that, then people are captivated. Oh, what is this? You want to know more about this? So, just as in some serials, you can have cliffhanger endings. So, like that, here, this is a cliffhanger trailer. You can see. It's, it's just it gives such an endearing conception that God is running away in fear and God gets caught. So, what kind, what kind of God is this? What is going on over here? So the first verse is so incredibly revealing about the extraordinary conception of God that is there over here. And this is the God who is conquered by love. That will come in the next verse. That God is so hungry, so eager, so eager for love that for the sake of love, he's even caught, he's even bound. And it is that all of us in our hearts, we long for love. <laughs> See, everything that we do, we might, get a, we might get a degree, we might get a job, we might get a position, we might get a car. So everything that we try to get, they might be physical possessions or they might even be personal attributes. We try to look good, we try to speak fluently, we try to act in a smart way. All these we try to acquire or develop in the hope of attracting love. Now we all need love. We all want to love and be loved. And we try to acquire many things so that we can attract love. But actually, this psychology, it comes originally from God. He says, we hunger for love. God also hungers for love. And he hungers 
not just for love, he hungers for our love, your love and my love. And how much he's hungry for love, generally it's seen by if how much is a person ready to give up for that love. So God is ready to give up his Godhood just to experience the richness of love. And that is revealed with this beautiful pastime of Ramodar, where God becomes tied by the love of his devotee. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on this conception of this beautiful conception of divinity that is revealed in the Damodar Ashtakam. So we be, our knowledge begins not with God, but begins with the world and its source. Maybe there is something which controls the world. Let me offer my obeisance to. Just as like Duryodhana also offered obeisance to Krishna because he saw Krishna's form. Ishwara. Maybe there is some controller who is bigger than you. So it's like a camera is zooming closer and closer and closer. First, there is some unknown force which I need to go down to. Maybe there is some personal controller. And then we go further and the Bhakti Dharma says that personal controller has a form. How can there be a form? We talk about form doesn't limit, it is matter that limits. We talk about difference between causation and correlation. Big hands and big vocabulary are correlated, but they are not causal. So similarly, form and limitation or formlessness and uh, form and limitation are correlated. But the cause of the limitation is not primarily the form, it is matter. So then God is God is God has a form, but he's not limited to his form. He can manifest in many forms, and in his limited seeming form, he can manifest the whole universe. And what is he doing as you move closer and closer? Vasat Kundalam Gokuli Brajaman. He is in the abode of Gokuli. He's a cowherd boy. His pet is cow. He delights in simplicity. <laughs> this is, so, this is a, at one level a universal conception of God as well as a specific revelation of God. The universal conception is that. God has these six attractive opulences, which every tradition will accept. But who is a person who fits that bill? It's like the president. Who is the president of America? One who has the followers of the president. There is no specific such description in any tradition, but the Bhakti tradition offers us that. Here is a person who fits that bill. And thus, it is now, although God is all powerful, it is Gokul, it is home. So we see a person in his home, they don't delight in their God, in their power. They delight in the reciprocation of love. And for the reciprocation of love, he subordinates his God. And he takes the role and the form that his devotee desires. So he becomes a child for those devotees who want to love him as a parent. So how can God be a child? That's out of love. Why does God steal? Because I talked about that. Generally, excitement is proportional to opposition. So for God, Iman there is no opposition because he's omnipotent. But he, he creates a setting where there is apparent opposition so that there is excitement. So he steals is not because he's a thief, but he just wants to increase his sweetness in the excitement in the relationship. And he steals butter because butter is the fruit of the love of his mother's heart and hands by which she has churned the milk and made it into butter. Milk and curd and made into butter. So the, our heart also becomes churned and soft. Take butter, Krishna comes and steals it. And how can he be fearful? People have fear of God, but God has fear of his mother. Why? Because now a rich relationship has all emotions. And all the fear is normally not considered attractive, but fear also has its charm in terms of, say, people watch horror movies and go on roller coasters. So God is not deprived of fear. So he experiences fear. Then his mother is angry with him. And then, although God is all powerful, nobody can catch him, but he is caught by Mother Yashoda. It's an in, incredible work to do. How is she able to do it? That is because of love. So God is so hungry for love that he's even ready to be not only subordinated, but kept, but bound by his devotee. So we all hunger for love because we are all parts of God. And he also hungers for love. But when we direct our love towards him, then our longing for love 
is eternally and perfectly fulfilled. So the Damodar Leela is a revelation of how loving God is. And that revelation can inspire us to direct our heart's love towards such a loving Lord. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Yes. Thank you so much for coming. But you mentioned towards the end that people are doing things in this world that are hankering of love. That's true. But this is a little bit unrelated to what you're saying. But so, so some people are like, they usually have like some great brother or something. And of course, that person, by being a great runner, has fame and whatnot. And maybe that can be considered as like love. But originally, when that person is doing running and taking it very seriously, their motivation for that is just for the sake of running or for the sake of that challenge or something like that. So how do you understand, like, a lot of people, they'll dedicate their lives just to these things for no apparent reason or, like, apparent, like, okay, that's a good point. A lot of time. That's a good point. So sometimes, some, say somebody's a champion, actually a champion runner, they dedicate themselves for running just because they love running. They, they don't, they're not looking for anything else to it. I say yes and no. Yes in the sense that all of us have a particular kind of body and mind. And with this body and mind, there are certain activities which are naturally compatible. And those activities are naturally attractive. So somebody might like to write. Somebody might like music. Somebody might like uh, art. And they just love it. They're immersed in it. So in this case, it's if, if something is compatible to the way of our body and mind, then we do it because it just everything flows smoothly. At the same time, while at a we, so there is one thing, there are various degrees of harmony. One level of harmony is harmony with our own body and mind. And if that harmony is not there, then there is constant irritation and satisfaction. But that is not the only harmony that we have. Even somebody who is an artist, they also would like to bond with other artists. I am a writer, I have written many books. So I bond with many different people. But somebody else who is a writer, and if I bond with them, then it's it's a very deep connection. So it's a, it is, we all need harmony at the physical, mental level also, with our own body and mind. And it makes our, it brings a certain level of joy and fulfillment to us. But that alone is not enough. We have various needs. We have a need to be in harmony with our body and mind. We have a need to be in harmony with the people around us, or at least some people around us. We have a need to be in harmony with the environment around us. And so these are the three circles in which the soul is situated. We talk about the three kleshas. Adi Atmik, Adi Bhautik, Adi Daivi. So these are the basically related to three circles in which you are situated. The body mind circle is the Adi Atmik. The social circle is the Adi Bhautik. The environmental circle is the Adi Daivik. So we need harmony with all of these. But ultimately, the most important harmony that we need is the harmony with the heart. The heart needs to connect. So we might be we might be doing something which we love to do that will give us some content. But if there's no one who really appreciates us, there are many fans, but even those people, celebrities who are fans, they want somebody close to them. Sometimes you know, your fans, uh, sometimes the fans can become burdens. Yeah. <laughs> and there's the, see, I mean, the irony of fame is. People work very hard to become famous. And after they become famous, they wear goggles so that nobody recognizes them when they get bored. <laughs> so they, they don't want the superficial admiration. They want deeper connections. So we, uh, that is also a human need. And it's not to be denied. But ultimately, when we do that also, we want, we want somebody to understand us, somebody to appreciate us, somebody to love us. Not superficially, but, but in a deeper way. That's your question. Thank you. Good question. Any other questions? Okay. Just about something you said earlier. So, like, 
I'm not exactly sure how to formulate this question, but the idea is that you mentioned that we are limited by our form, but Krishna is not limited by his form. Mm -hmm. But then, at least the way you were saying it, somehow doesn't that could be taken to undermine the the absoluteness of the form of Krishna because we consider the form of Krishna and like Krishna to be at the same level. So if Okay. Right. So, okay. Yeah. So, if we say that Krishna is not limited by its form, uh, does does that not compromise the absoluteness of Krishna's form? Because Krishna is a Krishna and his form is non different. Yes, there is the also the principle Pachinite Bhedave, inconceivable oneness and difference. So the idea is that God manifests in different levels. There is, as you know, the all-pervading effulgence of God is called Brahman. There is the localized controller at the, at the Paramatma. And then there is Bhagavan, who is the all-attractive supreme person. There are various conceptions of God. Or rather, you could say there are various levels of understanding of God. See, one way to understand this is in a, in a progression of spiritual understanding. We look at the world and we see that everything is changing. The big buildings, they may crash one day, the mountains may also get eroded. So then we start thinking, is there some, some unchanging substratum uh, below all that is constantly changing? And then we realize there's something spiritual that is unchanging. And that is seen as what is ultimate. So the idea that there is a un universal, unchanging substratum to reality. That is the impulse to us. That is the Brahman. It's all pervading. So Jiva Goswami, one of our prominent Acharyas, he says that when we conceive of the absolute as universal, undifferentiated consciousness, universal, undifferentiated, unchanging consciousness, that is the Brahman realization. That's one aspect of God. But another aspect of God is that, yes, there is this universal undifferentiated consciousness. But there is also, there is also a conscious being who is overseeing the world. So basically, the, in the impersonal understanding of God, consciousness is envisioned as this mere stream. So like right now, you're looking at me, I'm looking at you. So if you are looking at me, then, in the conscious experience, your experience of me, there are three things. There is you who are the subject of consciousness. From you, there is a stream of consciousness that is coming to me. And I am the object of consciousness. So, in the impersonal understanding, well, the object, the object and the subject are both considered to be user. And all that exists is only the stream of consciousness. The stream, only the stream of consciousness exists. But that doesn't make much sense because consciousness needs to have a subject and an object. Otherwise, who is conscious? Something has to be conscious. So the next level is the idea of this. There is a conscious being who is overseeing the material. That is the Paramatma. It's not just a stream of consciousness. It's also a center of awareness. And then, the further understanding is that there is not just a center of awareness. That there is a, the, the, who is overseeing the material world. That center, that conscious being also has a personal life in the spiritual. But to see that that consciousness has material potencies. Material potencies means the potency to oversee the material world. That is the Paramatma realization. But the consciousness also has spiritual potencies. That means at a spiritual level, this consciousness reciprocates love with other consciousness. That is the Bhagavan realization. So, when we, when we say Krishna's form is absolute, that is definitely true, but it's not a, it's not a simplistic idea that this is Krishna and that's all there is to it. So we need to understand that this is Krishna and this is more than what I see as this. So that's why to understand God, we need to begin with the definition of God, not the depiction of God. If you begin with the depiction of God, no, this is just one image in a place. How can this be God? 
We have to begin with the definition. So God's definition is itself multi-level. And there is, there is the personal aspect, there is the person, there is Brahman, Parmatma, Bhagwan. And when Krishna, and God is not limited by his form, what I mean is that actually Krishna is a person at one particular place, but he is not just that. Or rather, that form is not simply what we conceive it. That's why we could say there is, there is impersonal, personal, and there is transpersonal. Transpersonal is transcendental personality. So Krishna's personality is not like ours. And he is not different from his form. And yet, he is also the all-pervading Brahman. He is also the Paramatma. And that's why his form is not simply what we conceive. That's the question. Thank you. Any last question? So thank you very much. Sri Damodar Ashtakam ki. Sri Krishna Bhagavan ki. Shri La Prabhupada ki. Gaur Bhattadanda ki. Gaur Prima.